My name is Sid Moore and I am a writer. I write mainly about the Essex witch hunts because I think they're really terrible miscarriages of justice. And I am also an activist and I campaign for women's equality and I am the founder of the Essex Girls Liberation Front. My family are a kind of classic mix of local and London diaspora, which is really classic to Essex, actually. So both my mum and my dad lived in London and my mum's family came down during or just after the Blitz and settled in Essex. And my dad's family came down a little bit later. They grew up in Essex, in Hockley, which is a little village not far from where I live. I have a whole series which is called the Essex Witch Museum Mysteries. And they are based in a small village called Adder's Fork. Adder's Fork is one of the ingredients that Macbeth's witches used in their cauldron for their spell. And Adder's Fork is the name of the village, which is quite based on the village of Hockley, where my parents grew up. And my nan also lived not far from it in a cottage, which was semi-rural. And my nan was a really fantastic influence on me. And I don't think I would be writing any of this stuff without her. Although she was Christian, at the same time, she also did spells. This is a bit horrible, but when I was 15, I had a wart on my hand and it wouldn't go away. And I'd been to the hospital quite a few times to get it burnt off. And I was going over to see my nan and she just said, oh, why didn't you just let me get rid of it? And I just said, oh, well, you know, how? And so she said, look, we'll just give it to this piece of meat. So she gave me a piece of meat, or she actually rubbed the meat onto my wart, and then she got two hairs from a black cat. And then at midnight, she went and buried it at the bottom of the garden, round this sort of white mound that we used to have there. It was a mound with white flowers on it, which we used to call the fairy cake. And when we were very little, we used to leave food out for the fairies down there. Well, it's probably the rats, but... Anyhow, she went, according to her, she buried it under the light of the moon. And within a week, my wart had dropped off clean, just gone. My nan would do things like that all the time, so... Yeah, although I lived in quite a suburban place when I was growing up, Nan would always bring this kind of magic with her. She would do sort of little magic spells and she would read tea leaves as well, which we always found loads and loads of fun. But she would also, when we were little, she would always tell us fairy stories. She was a brilliant storyteller and it really ignited my imagination, I think. She would also talk about classical fairy stories, but at the same time, my parents were kind of disturbed because I was really interested in the witches. I was never really interested in the princesses. I was not really a Snow White girl, you know, all the princesses, all the kind of like female heroines, they were all right, but I was really much more interested in the witches because the witches had, I guess what I'd call now an agency. They had power, they had magic, and they could fly. I mean, you know, what kind of kid doesn't want to be able to fly on a broomstick? So for me, they were much more fascinating than the princesses who were just, you know, literally lying around sleeping or waiting for their life to begin when some bloke turned up and rescued them. It just didn't work for me. At the time, I was considered a tomboy. And um, that term itself is, is kind of a conundrum because what basically I did was I was very active and I was very rough and tumble and I I did have long hair at one point but I was banned from climbing next door neighbour's willow tree and I was banned from eating chewing gum so being terribly naughty as I was I went up the willow tree and I got my chewing gum and my pigtails stuck together with the leaves and I had to be cut out um, so my hair got cut off and everyone used to think that I was a boy. And of course, my real name is Samantha. I was named after Samantha and Bewitched, who is a witch, funnily enough. But everyone called me Sam and I was very like my dad. So they'd either call me Sam 
or Little Tony. I had a vivid imagination when I was a kid and I was always forming clubs which were like detective clubs solving like footprints on the floor and things like that and trying to find mysteries and things that didn't you know had no mysteries when I was in the brownies I wrote a play for my theatre badge and the play I think that you can see hints here of what was to come so the play was the last days of Anne Boleyn complete with the execution and uh, loads and loads of ketchup and like fake head rolling off the stage which traumatised loads and loads of the audience and I did get told off afterwards by Brown Owl but I got the badge which for me was the main thing and then yeah I kind of like always always liked reading always liked writing I went to university and I did actually I went to Leeds and I went to the Breton Hall campus or college which was the performing arts part of it and I did a really fantastic course called English and Inter Arts and it was at the late 80s and they were really progressive and they tried to get you to experiment with whatever form you were interested in so that led me to experiment in poetry, performance art, painting, video technology, loads and loads of different things. It was a fantastic course uh, called English and Inter Arts. I, I really, really loved it. When I finished it, I didn't know what to do with my life, like most people. But I was really interested in books, like reading. So I ended up getting a job in what was then called Sheraton Shoes Bookshops. They got bought by Waterstones. And so I then transferred down to Wales Court. And then I worked in bookselling for about five or six years, I think. And I moved around quite a few of the London shops. One of my specialisms was mind, body and spirit books. So I started to get really interested in different philosophies. And I was really, yeah, quite interested in earth magic. And I was quite interested in paganism. I was very interested in tarot. I did sort of flirt with all of these things in my early 20s. Never really found my place in anything. I kind of like felt that I hadn't found my tribe, but it was interesting. I was in my early 20s and I was interested in in exploring different routes. And this became a very literal thing for me eventually. And in my mid 20s, I did decide to go traveling again in that kind of like classic sort of hippie even though I wasn't a hippie I really really hated hippies at the time I was like indie indie girl in fact I was a riot girl um so again very interested in feminism my kind of expression of interest in feminism found its way out in the kind of riot girl movement Live music was really important to me. Going to bands was really important to me. Going clubbing was really important to me. <laughs> Going to festivals was really important to me. I used to go to Glastonbury and Reading. So basically, I was quite hedonistic, I think, but also searching for spiritual enlightenment. And this all culminated with me travelling. And I travelled through different parts of Asia because it was the day before the internet, all we had were letters or phone calls. And when I'd been in Thailand, I'd had one night where I'd been really, really worried. We were on a, an island called Koh Chang, which at that time had just little huts on it and generators. Apparently now it's been really developed, but there was no roads. You could only get about 50 foot in from the the water because it was all jungle it's very very thick jungle there was nothing beyond it I actually decided to get a fishing boat to shore the next day just to try and phone my parents from a, a phone place managed to queue up and then get a phone and I phoned everybody and there was no answer from anybody one of my stepbrothers cousins picked up the phone eventually and I just said is everything all right is everything is everyone all right I can't get hold of anyone and he said yes everything is all right everything is all right so I said good good and then he just said look I've got to go and then he put the phone down so I was like all right okay well at least everybody's all right 
when I eventually, I think, I can't remember if I phoned again, but eventually I got to Australia and we went to my then boyfriend's house. And when I got there, there was a letter from my mum telling me that my nan had died. And my nan had died just after I had uh, flown out. In fact, the night that I flew out, she had had a stroke and ended up in hospital and she died a few days later. So that was my first kind of uh, sense of bereavement. And I I did feel a huge loss because, you know, as I said, my nan had been such an important figure in my life. And I kind of felt that she would go on forever. And really weirdly, that the day that I went to the airport and I said goodbye to her and she gave me seven kisses and each one was for a different thing one was for good long life one was for love one was for luck one was for money and then she let me go and that was the last time I saw her and I don't know again it's kind of like a ritual and it just is it's it's very powerful moment that resonates with me still to the day this day and so she finds her way into a lot of my fiction in the strange series like I said um, where she used to live some of the street names I've taken and I've kind of woven into the fabric of Adder's Fork this fictional village that I've created and also some of the characters that are in my book the main character is called Rosie Strange and my name was called Rose and a lot of the qualities that Rose's grandmother has were things that my nan had as well. Rosie Strange, who, as I said, is named after my nan, she's an out and proud Essex girl. She exhibits a lot of the characteristics of Essex girls, but she completely challenges the stereotype all the time she's had enough of it which is like really similar to me because yeah I have had enough of it and people don't realize how insidious it is but when you know what the Essex girl dictionary explanation is and it is a young working class woman from the Essex area typically considered as unintelligent materialistic devoid of taste and sexually promiscuous So I kind of have explored this and tried to sort of dismantle and dissect what it is to be an Essex girl. And also I have little Rosie, who is my mouthpiece on it. And she can like, (laughs) in the book, she goes a lot further than I ever would. But she challenges it all the time. So she's a brilliant vehicle for me to kind of explore what's going on with that and with the you know, wider inequality as well in this country. And so one of the things that I have done along the way is to found the Essex Girls Liberation Front. I have been campaigning about the Essex Girl for a long time and I developed this game called Super Strumps, which is like Top Trumps. It looks at lots of different female stereotypes and actually peels back the negative connotations. So... In the Superstrumps pack of cards, you have all of these different names for the Essex girl, some of which aren't very pleasant. And she's very similar to lots of other regional stereotypes, like the Jersey girl. And there's also the Valley girl, the Cardiff girl, the Scouse girl, you know, all quite similar. But we also gave them these fantastic qualities. And we also wanted to give them all a magical power. So the Essex girl is invulnerable to cold. (laughs) So all of them have got lots of little magical tricks that they can do. And we got 100 women to come in and rate each card. So you can play them at like top chance and it gives you a prompt to have a conversation about female stereotypes. But we also, at the Essex Girls Liberation Front, have done campaigning and we've written to different dictionaries. We also did the Processions March, which was in London, to celebrate 100 years of some of the women getting some of the vote. And we've done lots of different festivals and lots of different events. There's a lot of work that needs to be done with equality, you know, in this country and abroad. And these are things that I also try to write about in my books all the time, because what's the point of having a platform if you can't do something good with it? What I get out of writing is, it's a fantastic outlet for my creativity. I really 
feel that I have to communicate <laughs> with a lot of people. That's like a really big urge in trying to shout and change the world, I think. My dad was a policeman and my mum was a Sunday school teacher. In fact, I was a Sunday school teacher at some point as well. I have got a really strong sense of justice, which I feel, and that it's sort of my moral duty to to try and do something. If you find out about a terrible miscarriage of justice like, like the witch hunts, then what do you do? Do you just sort of go, oh, that's terrible? Or do you try to tell other people about it and... Some people think this is something that's happened in the past and it doesn't need to be looked at. But there are so many parallels with today. You know, scapegoating, bullying, othering. These are issues that we deal with all the time in 21st century life. And we need to be reminded of what happens when things get out of hand. I do think it would be great if we had some kind of memorial for all of these women and men and some children whose lives were lost to the witch hunts in Essex and all over the UK actually. Yeah so writing allows me to get onto my soapbox and I love also language. I'm really one of those weird people who loves looking at the etymology of different words and I love experimenting with language. I'm very much an activist and a campaigner and one of the things I also write about in my books is that the witch hunts aren't a thing of the past even as a metaphor they're not a thing of the past they are there are witch hunts which are still going on around the world at the moment in India and Kenya Um, In Nigeria, it's something that is going on all over the world. My literary platforms allow me to go out and to talk in places I never would have dreamed of going about different human rights crises around the world at the moment and in the UK. But I, I think as well, I'm able to investigate history, which is another love of mine. I'm able to investigate Essex, which... I know people find surprising, but which I think is a very, very beautiful county full of extremes. And and I also get to research and find out about some amazing women. So, you know, I have a really privileged life and I'm really grateful that I can continue to do this and that people will buy my books and be interested in them and facilitate me continuing to do this for many years, I hope. natural world I do find really inspiring not in a David Attenborough kind of way but in a kind of pantheistic way I guess I do like to feel that there is sort of an energy a spirit in the woods sometimes I do feel that sometimes I feel like when I'm on my walks that I'm being watched I have a very open mind about what the truth is what's out there but I do enjoy letting my imagination play and I think there is such great beauty to be found in the world and such extraordinariness in some of the most mundane things that you see around you. I love going for swims in the sea. There is just absolutely nothing like being able to dip into the estuary and yeah I of course, I can see South End Pier and I can see the chimneys and the factories over the other side in Kent. But there is something just absolutely wonderful about swimming in the sea. It's like an emotional palate cleanser and it will just change your mood. And you can, doesn't matter what mood you go into the sea with, when you come out, you will be in a better, brighter mood. And I think that's because you've connected somehow with the world with our natural world that we sometimes take for granted and you know I'm not surprised that our ancestors thought that there was magic out there because I think it doesn't matter whether you're a skeptic or not you we are all aware that there is magic in the world whatever you want to call it it does have an effect on us and it can make us feel wonderful